Casey here, and I just wanted to check in with you as we enter into the Easter week and give you just a little devotion. Something that I've been going over this last week has been the triumphal entry, trying to get ready for Palm Sunday. And I had this really cool revelation that I found as I was reading through Luke 19 at 37 through 40, I, I started having all these hits of just some parallel that was going on. And it struck me that 2 Samuel 6 and Luke 19 look ridiculously similar in their format. And so I just wanted to share this with you and and basically just share with you both stories and let us just move on from there. So I'm going to start here in Luke 19, um, going through uh, verses 37 through 40. The Bible says this. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, As he was drawing near... Already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I thought it was really, really cool. If I skip over to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, I'm going to try not to lose my place um, a lot there, but you see this interaction of David and Michael that's very similar as well. Um, As we see, starting in verse 16 of chapter 6, and it really starts before this, is uh, David is bringing the ark into Jerusalem. Jesus was entering into the city of Jerusalem. We see this triumphal entry of the presence of God being among his people. I want, want you to not miss that. The presence of God is coming to Jerusalem. It's coming to the city of David in both of these contexts. And as it's happening, there's this procession going on. And in verse 16, it kind of shows you how this procession is happening. It starts out by talking about uh, Michael, uh, the daughter of Saul, or the wife of David, but it never talks about her as the wife of David, just as the daughter of Saul. And that's an important thing as well. It says in verse 16, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had um, pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among them, all of the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both man and woman. Ah, there we go both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, It is before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his household to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself even more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. All right. Do you see any parallels between that and the trial, triumphal entry, triumphal entry in Jerusalem from Jesus? Let me just break a few down for you real quick. The first parallel that I see happening is they're both going to Jerusalem. And I, I said that a little bit earlier. They're both going to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, which contains God himself, right? Like that, that is where God rested. He had them build this ark specifically so that his presence could be with them in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. Like this is God coming to Jerusalem. And what do the people do? They decide to just lift up a mighty shout, to praise him, to dance for him, to to just parade 
this ark, this procession, as God is going to the high place, to the Holy of Holies and the tabernacle, where he is going to dwell among his people again, in their mind, forever, right? God is coming, and he will be with us forever. What's happening in Jerusalem when Jesus goes in? Well, people don't know that Jesus is going to die on the cross. People think that their king has finally come to dwell with them again. And Jesus comes riding in on this donkey, and all of his disciples, the multitude of his disciples, start praising God and all the mighty works that he's done. This procession starts happening where they're they're parading Jesus into Jerusalem. We see this, this exact same thing happen as Jesus is going to be their king. He is going to be the one who rules over his people. Finally, their Messiah is here. This is their context. This is what their mind is. Here's the second parallel I see. We see them participating in worship all together. The second parallel that I see is we see people decide not to participate in worship. Okay? We see Michael decide as she looks at what's happening. And and if you actually read that passage, you see that, that Michael sees that David is leaping and dancing for the Lord. She knows that he's doing this for God. Okay, that's really important because she blames him later for doing it for the lady servants. But she knows when she looks at him, he's doing this for the Lord. And she decides when he comes home and he's going to bless her and he's going to to probably try to have a baby with her most likely because that's an important piece at the end of this passage. What she sees or what she does instead is she rebukes him. She says, what are you doing? She starts going after him about how he's worshiping in the wrong way, how he can't control himself, how he's ripping his clothes off and displaying himself for servant women. What do we see the Pharisees do when Jesus is entering and all of his disciples are being crazy in their eyes? They know who they're worshiping. They know why they are there. They see that, they even interact with Jesus and say, rebuke your disciples. They decide not to participate, and both Michael and the Pharisees rebuke the worshipers for worshiping the Lord. And they do it in their own ways, but they both rebuke the people who are worshiping God. The third parallel that I see in this is that both Michael and the Pharisees miss out not only on the participation of being able to worship God together and reflect on the mighty works that God had done. As David brings the ark in, they, they give sacrifices, um, they, they um, bless or he blesses his people, they share stories about what God has done in the past, they have their own worship service, and then they go home with a a cake of dates and raisins, which are aphrodisiacs, they're going home with the intent to obey God with the first commandment that he gave them, which was to be fruitful and multiply. That's the blessing. They participated in worship and they received the blessing of obeying God. The people who decided not to participate, Michael and the Pharisees, missed out on the blessing that God had for them. All right, here's how it works. The Pharisees, we see them say, rebuke your disciples. What happens with the Pharisees? Not only are they scolded by Jesus throughout his ministry, but they miss out on new life, on new life. Why is that important? What's the parallel? Well, if we go back to 2 Samuel, we see that Michael missed out on her blessing too. And her blessing is David came home to bless his family just as he sent everybody away to their own homes to be blessed with those cakes of dates and raisins, those aphrodisiacs, they're going to get freaky. He comes home to bless his wife, who is only known to us as the daughter of Saul, not as the wife of David. And here's why. Because she decides to scold David for worshiping God. And the very last thing that the Bible says about her 
is that for the rest of her days, she had no children. There was no new life. There was no generation to hear the stories of what God did. From Michael, she wasn't able to pass on the mighty works of God as she did not participate in the procession of God coming to Jerusalem through the ark. The Pharisees never got to share with their children the story of Jesus coming as God, coming down from heaven on earth, the Messiah coming to free his people. They never got to share the story of him going to the cross and them not understanding why and honestly not wanting him to be in their life in that moment. They're not able to share the reality that he rose from the dead and they got to have that veil torn from their eyes to be able to see the reality that Christ came to save them from death and destruction and to give them new life through the Holy Spirit. They never got to share that story with the next generation. Here's the deal. We're going into this week, and we got stories to share. If you have followed Christ, if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then you've got a story to shout about. I'm not saying you got to tell everybody everything, but man, you should. You've got something to rejoice in. You have seen God do work in your life. If you're saved, you have the story of that salvation moment of when you encountered Jesus for the first time and understood, I want to follow him. And when you decided to do that, you had just witnessed a mighty work of God and now you are his witness. And when we come together, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, man, that's the procession. We are his children, able to profess the truth of what he has done for us. Don't miss out on participating in worship this week. If you're on stage, go nuts. If you're in the congregation, shout it out. You're still a worship leader. If you're serving from on the stage or off the stage, if you're in a jungle or if you're in the air conditioning or if you're in the heat of Canada, uh, indoor heating, whatever, wherever you're at, I don't care. The point is, you have the opportunity to participate, to take part in this worship. Don't miss out on the blessing of being part of this great worship service here in 2022. I love you guys, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for watching this. You have a great week.